What is the Death Star's other fatal flaw? Okay, so I think we are all now aware that the recently completed Death Star has a tiny, tiny flaw in its dis- <coughs> oh, Okay, okay, it's a major flaw. I'll acknowledge that, but I have some news. There's another major flaw that we have to deal with. If we fire our giant super laser, everyone in this station is going to turn into paste. Wait, wait! We can work out a solution to this with science. Dang, Vade. Dang. The Star Wars superweapons known as Death Stars have been overly analyzed for over 40 years now. And in that time, fans and even other Star Wars movies have added weaknesses and design flaws to the weapons. However, there is one particular consequence to firing a planet-destroying laser that I think is often overlooked. It has nothing to do with exhaust ports, cores, or rebels, but it could be just as disastrous for the Empire. First, how powerful is the Death Star's laser? All you have to do is jump to know that it takes some work, some force applied over some distance like your legs are doing to move an object with mass away from a source of gravity. Smart boy Isaac Newton's law of gravitation multiplied by distance describes this amount of work. And it says that the further you want to move some object away from a source of gravity, the more work, the more energy <laughs> it will take. Now, if you wanted to completely destroy a planet, one interpretation of a successful demonstration bleh, would be the work you'd have to put into that planet with a laser in order to take out every single bit of its mass so far apart that it wouldn't reform under gravity. This is called the planet's gravitational binding energy. So what we can do now to get that gravitational binding energy is imagine the planet that we want to destroy as an arbitrarily large number of arbitrarily thin shells. Then if we add up all of the energy that we would need to take each shell out to infinity with some work so that it wouldn't reform under gravity, we would get the total amount of energy for total obliteration. If you make a few assumptions about the planet you want to destroy, like it's a perfect sphere of uniform density, and you go through the full calculus for all these shells, you can check out the full derivation in the show notes, it's actually not that bad, you get this expression, which is how much energy you would have to put into a planet to destroy it Death Star style. This is unlimited mathematical power. If a planet like Alderaan is an Earth-sized planet, then the gravitational binding energy equation tells us that the amount of energy that this station's super laser needs to put out is at least 200 million trillion trillion joules. That's as much energy as Earth's sun puts out over an entire week. You may fire when ready. Scum. But the flaw I was talking about earlier isn't how much energy this station has to produce. It's what would happen to every fleshy body on board this station if we released that much energy all at once. I mean, we can't all be walking tin cans. Light may not have mass, but it does have momentum. And a super laser's momentum would easily be deadlier than a light Oh, I cut it off! Smart boy Albert Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, is arguably the most famous equation in all of human history. And yet, I bet most of you haven't seen its final form. E equals MC squared only considers objects at rest. Once those objects start moving, their momentum, P, which is a product of their mass and velocity, also starts adding to the total energy. And for our purposes here, light, like laser light, doesn't have any mass. So we can cross out this part of Einstein's equation. What we're left with is energy equaling momentum times the speed of light. And because momentum is conserved, even something like a massless laser can have recoil. 
I know it may not intuitively feel like it, but all lasers have some recoil. The reason why we don't feel any recoil from something like a typical laser pointer is because it simply doesn't have that much energy, and so it can't put that much force on your body. Maybe one pico newton or one trillionth of a newton of force. If we had real laser rifles, they probably wouldn't have much of a kick to them either. Doing some estimations, they might put a force on you that's in the milli Newton range. You might not even feel it fire. But the Death Star, you would definitely feel. Just from the exponent alone, you can see that the Death Star Super Laser will have an absolutely incredible amount of momentum. And like any other firing weapon, if it is flinging that momentum forwards, it's gonna experience an equal and opposite momentum backwards. And it's enough to be the Death Star's other fatal flaw. I know, I'm getting to it. I'm just, you're not gonna like it. If this station fires, everyone on board is going to liquefy. If we discharge this station's laser, depending on our assumptions, there are a few sighted diameters, even though we made it, and I'm assuming that this station is a sphere of solid steel, it helps make everything easier, then we will fire a laser with enough momentum to fling us backwards at anywhere from 44 to 100 kilometers per second. That is literally faster than anything the humans have ever made in that galaxy far, far away. It takes us about five seconds to discharge the laser, right? So if we go from zero to 235,000 miles per hour in five seconds backwards, we are gonna pull anywhere between 900 and 2100 Gs. Anyone wearing their seatbelts is gonna be torn in half and anyone standing on the decks is gonna hit the walls so hard that they are going to become ketchup. Fine, fine, fine. You don't believe me? You may fire when ready. Wow, good thing we had another one of those. You could say that it's ironic that if the Death Star fired at Alderaan, Alderaan would kind of get its own revenge. But there are ways the Empire could engineer around this problem. The easiest way to minimize the deadly recoil of the Death Star super laser would be to make the whole station more massive so that the same amount of momentum doesn't affect the station's velocity as much. And so Death Star engineers would wanna find the densest materials possible to make the station as massive as possible. But again, there's a problem. Never mind. To keep the acceleration of the station down to a comfortable 1G, the station would need to be solid and denser than steel. <laughs> denser than osmium, which is the densest substance that we know of at standard temperatures and pressures, something denser than the core of our sun. To get the acceleration of the station down to comfortable or almost nothing, we don't see it move in the films at all, the engineers would have to find a stable material that was as dense as white dwarf stars. And as far as we know, a stable material like that just does not exist. Oh, uh, there it is, oh, I'm sorry. But let's just say that in the Star Wars universe, there's some readily available, stable, hyper-dense material that would make the Death Star so massive everyone on board wouldn't turn into goo every time the super laser fired. Fine. Ugh, that could work, but it would also give the station a surface gravity of 15 Gs, according to our assumptions and calculations. And that would make me feel as though I weighed a literal ton. Various sources do say that the Death Star has a large gravitational pull, so this kind of value kind of makes sense, but it also makes the majority of the station unlivable. It's canon that everyone in the Death Star lives and works on or near the surface, but with this kind of gravity, only the core within five kilometers of it would have habitable gravity. And this is right where the Death Star's laser and power source is supposed to be. So this contradicts the core design of the station itself from a 
certain point of view. A certain point of view? Mm, yes. A more sensible option, though, would be to simply match the thrust from the Death Star's laser with thrust from the Death Star's engines. But this, too, would be incredibly dangerous and fuel-intensive, and we don't see any of the engines firing ever in any of the movies. The reason that the possible solutions to deadly Death Star recoil are so intense is that the scale of energy we're talking about here is absolutely enormous. One last comparison forward for context. If you put the laser system of the Death Star inside of Earth and you fired, it would move about this fast. It's slow, sure, but the fact that a massless laser could move the entire Earth at a speed that you could perceive should most impress you. So while we all know that the Death Star has flaws, a big one isn't so obvious. If a station had a laser powerful enough to destroy whole planets, it would also fling itself backwards at a rate that would smoochify everyone on board in the process. There are ways to engineer around this problem, but if one teenager with one proton torpedo and not the best bangs, let's admit, wasn't obvious to Death Star engineers, who knows if they thought this problem through? Because science. But honestly, the Empire's sad devotion to this kind of design hasn't helped them defeat the Rebels, nor has uh, 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 this is a weird situation where if we make our calculations even more realistic, it's even worse for the Death Star. Because if you assume it's not a solid sphere, it wouldn't be, there'd be people and decks and stuff like that, then it's less massive and it would be thrown backwards even faster and no laser can be 100% efficient, which means it would have to put out even more energy to get past that efficiency and destroy something with gravitational binding energy. So if it's even more realistic, it's even worse First, which leads to even more ketchup people inside of a floating sphere that a teenager destroyed. Thank you so much for watching, Lisa. If you like this video on Facebook, like it again. And if you like this video on YouTube, subscribe and hit that notification bell, fam, as the kids say, because we get up to a lot of weird stuff on this channel, not just these episodes, but also vlogs and live streams. And if you go to alpha at projectalpha.com, you can sign up and get this main show two days earlier than anyone else and get other premium content like Natural Selection, the debate show that I do with Dan Casey, which is a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. And you can can vote if you're on Alpha. Also, follow Because Science on Instagram and Twitter here and also me.